Welcome back, folks, to the Membership Machine Show. This is episode 87. Got a really great special guest here, folks. We've got Ryan Robinson in the house. He's a really prolific blogger, podcaster, community builder, entrepreneur, has many hats, been very successful in many of these separate areas, but they all kind of have a linkage about building community online in one way or another he's a true expert on this subject i thought you would get enormous value by listening to what he's learned in his own journey of entrepreneurship and building membership websites for himself and for a number of clients so ryan would you like to quickly introduce yourself to the audience? Hey, you did a great job. Thank you for for having me. And yeah, I've been doing been doing the blogging, content creation, community building thing for man, approaching fifteen years here soon, which is crazy. Well, did you start doing it when you were ten or something? <laughs> I started doing it actually pretty much when I was in college. My college professor for internet marketing, it was called back then. Uh, had us all register domain names the first thing we did when we sat down in class and it really kind of sparked my interest so you can blame him for everything that i can blame him i'm still in touch with him because it was so like influential in the course my life has taken so far which is very cool yes i like i have interviewed ryan before on another podcast and he must have enjoyed it because he agreed to come back (laughs) i think he likes my english humor in some ways uh um so it's going to be a fabulous show like i say we're going to be delving in what he thinks you need to understand and do connected to building a successful membership website in 2024 and a number of other interesting questions i've got for him But before we go into the meat and potatoes of this great show, I've got a couple of messages from our major sponsors. We will be back in a few moments, folks. Hi there, e-commerce store owner. At Omnisend, we help more than 100,000 e-commerce customers just like you sell their products. We're an all-in-one email and SMS marketing platform that helps you reach your customers, grow your audience, and increase sales. In fact, our customers have seen incredible results with Omnisend, averaging $72 in revenue for every single dollar spent. And if you ever have a question, our award-winning customer support team is available 24-7 every single day. That's one of the reasons we have more than 6,000 glowing reviews and ratings all across the web. So get started with Omnisend today and start growing your business with better email and SMS marketing. We're coming back, folks. I want to point out we've got some great special offers from the major sponsors, plus a curated list of the best WordPress plugins that will help you build a membership website on WordPress, which I honestly feel is still the best solution if you want to build a real membership business online, plus a load of other free goodies. You can get all this by going over to wp-tonic.com slash deals. wp-tonic.com slash deals. And you'll find all the goodies there. What more could you ask for? I love it. Probably a lot more, but that's all you're going to get from that (laughs) page. Uh, um, It's funny, Ryan. The amount of people, it's become a bit of a tagline. That I don't know, it just came out one episode that I had people starting to email me um, so that they found it hilarious. So I've just kept on doing it, Ryan. It's funny what people really like, isn't it, Ryan? It is. We all la- see this is actually interesting as it relates to community building is that I really believe strongly that the people who you know want to join your community follow your content engage with you they really like your weird personality quirks that's how it goes is that is that a polite way to say i'm a total nut and ryan <laughs> that well i didn't say that those were your words <laughs> <laughs> right he's, he's such a dipper bat 
Something which I I can't. I know this is going to be shocking, Ryan, but I can be diplomatic when I want to. It's just that a lot of the time I just don't want to. Be. <laughs> I, know I do think the like the secret superpower for everyone is when you unlock what your weird is and you figure out how to weave it into the content you create. The only thing I would say in my defense, unlike a few people I know in podcasting and influencers, when you meet me in person, I'm not much different to what I am yeah. in a podcast where I've met quite a few other people and it's a total act basically yeah. they're totally different um so let's go on to one of my questions so what do you think are some of the critical things people need to understand connected to launching a membership website in 2024 i i still think even if you haven't got a load of experience you can still get the thing going and you can get the thing on the right journey I think if you've got a bit of marketing online experience, it's going to be easier. But I think you can still do it. But what do you think are some of the key things, one or two key things that people got to really understand? I actually believe that membership communities are one of the best ways to like start monetizing an audience online. And the, the reason why I like it the best is that you can do it with a really small audience. You don't need to have a community with hundreds of people when you start. It can literally be like one, two, three, four, five, ten people, and you have a membership community. People will pay you, you know, X dollars amount a month in order to create some content with them, maybe host some live streams, bring them some like exclusive stuff. And so just from the perspective of what a community is, I think that's like the core foundation of any really good starting point. And from my perspective, this is all about attracting the right audience. So you have to really spend some time learning what problems the people have within your target market that you can uniquely help them solve and start working with people one-on-one. -on -one. I'm a big fan of doing unscalable things when you're getting started. So find those people who really resonate with you and maybe you go and you find them on Reddit or Quora or in the comments section of other websites where that audience you want to reach already exists. Maybe you do some guest posts, join some podcasts, YouTube channels, etc. But the key principle here is, I think, find individuals, especially when you're starting kind of the community building, membership building process, and really like have genuine authentic, real conversations with them, get them on a Zoom call, chat with them over text or email and figure out how you can actually help them rather than say, going out and building a ton of content and then putting together this, you know, membership structure and a perfectly looking website and then hoping that people come. I think the more that you can do this organically by just actually connecting with real people and then inviting them to join kind of the the v, v1 let's say of your membership program the better yeah i've been highly influenced by a friend of mine rob rowling of the um, startups for the rest of us podcast i don't know if you're if rob's in your radar at all um but he's wrote a number of books and he's very influential in the bootstrap startup world and i religiously listen to his podcast and he's become a friend over the years and you know in bootstrap startup world you've got this concept of minimum viable product and i just nicked his i i just nick his ideas and i talk a lot about adapting startup concepts and applying them to membership um so I, I go on about building the minimum viable course a lot. Yeah. So would you agree with that? Oh my gosh. I think that's actually the only way to do it because I mean, my, my first course that I made 12 years ago or something like that, I was doing a lot of freelance work. And so people that I knew started asking me for advice on how to build a freelance business. And so I did a course that was about how to land more freelance clients and I had a little bit of an audience, like I was blogging already, but I didn't have a huge audience and I made this mistake. So I had to learn this the painful way of going out and building the course first. And so 
Today, what I do anytime I'm launching new educational products is actually pre-sell the course. So I put in the work ahead of time to figure out, all right, here's what the course I think should be. Now, let me start sending some emails to my community. Let me publish some blog posts. Let me maybe drop out a podcast episode, a YouTube video, or do a guest post and link to a waiting list where people can sign up or ideally pre-order the course. So voting with your wallet is definitely the best way to get people to say, all right, yes, I confidently want to buy this course when it's ready. And of course, like, you know, offer people a 50% discount or something for doing the pre-order with you. And then you have your first crop of people in your community to test your content with. You can invite them to a Facebook group or, you know, Discord, Slack, school, whatever you want to use as kind of that community platform. I mean, you guys do this great yourselves. And so inviting people to help you as you're creating content and testing it and getting feedback is such a great way to build out a course or a community. Another concept I, I've totally stolen from Rob is, <laughs> at least I give him credit. He says he doesn't mind, Lord, did you mention his name? If you even stealing his ideas. Um, but I think he got this from other sources himself. It's, um, I'm just interested to put this to you to see how important you feel it is. Is the concept he puts forward regularly um, a painkiller or a vitamin, and you really want a solution that's a painkiller? Um, they, I think if you, it's, you're doing your first course, you need a little bit of urgency and you need to be solving a, a pain problem rather you can still be successful going the aspiration or the vitamin route, uh, but I think you're best going f to solving a problem and there being some urgency in the people that are seeking. That's why I think a lot of people that are around certification or you've got a group that have to take a, a specific test or there's some urgency that's required and you can provide a, a solution. I think that's, I've noticed in the people, the many people that we help and host, those that are in that area seem to do very well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's such a difference between someone paying for something that's a nice to have versus what they perceive to be a must have. So what I think is when you're mapping out what that course idea is for you, figure out what is the tangible thing at the end of the course that someone is going to really feel they're getting. And ideally, does that create some sort of change or positive impact in their lives on a skill they want to build? Or I think the best case scenario is creating some sort of course product or community with the goal of helping people grow their business. The closer you can connect what your course outcome is to revenue earned for the people who are taking your course, I mean, the more essential it, it becomes to them. And I think the stronger your marketing messaging can be too. So you've done a lot of courses. You've built a lot of courses yourself. What was, what's been some of the biggest surprises you've encountered in your own journey, especially the, the early years? Um, was there a couple of things that you learned that just you were surprised about? A couple, yeah. Like the first one that st like stands out to me, honestly, is that people would pay me for a course. Like, first of all, that concept just kind of blew my mind 10 years ago when, I mean, I think I, I was 24, 10 years ago. And that was around when I started launching my first courses. And I knew some stuff, of course, but looking back in hindsight, I was a 24 year old dude and I had done some cool stuff. But at the same time, like most of the people who were buying my course were older than me. And that's a really fascinating thing where I have this life experience that ended up being really valuable to share the lessons that I'd learned from. And so that was that was a bit of a surprise. But honestly, I think the biggest surprise, and this one kind of remains constant, is 
how few people will actually go through an entire course from start to finish and get something like then implement that stuff and get a real positive impact or change in their business and their life on their skills that they're trying to build. That one still surprises me. Like you, you would assume, Oh, anyone who's paying, you know, 300, $500 for a course, they're going to finish it and they're going to want to get results from it. So they see an ROI. Right. But I think a lot of people want to get that course. They want the end result, but then when it comes to, doing the actual hard work of implementation of something that's outside of their comfort zone, why they got the course anyway, that's where a lot of people will fall down. So when I think through structuring a course these days, I really try and strategically help people continue with momentum. And so if you start with the hardest, you know, module in your course right at the beginning, mm, that's pretty risky. A lot of people are going to hit that wall and be like, oh no, what did I do? <laughs> it also depends on what the audience is. Is it a, is it a, a beginner course? Is it intermediate? Is it, you know, if it's an advanced course, the expectation and going into the weeds very quickly. Yeah they're going to expect that in a way and not going in going in deep quick will be the opposite think, of a beginner's intermediate course is this making sense am i correct you're the one that's got a lot more experience um, <laughs> i've consumed a load of courses and i've helped a load of people set them up but i've never run that many myself from my experience, if you have what you would consider to be an advanced level of expertise at your craft, the thing that you're teaching a course on, then teaching it to other people who are advanced and just want to level up is the best thing you can do. If you have an advanced audience, they are going to be so much more invested in, I guess, getting an outcome that's desirable from consuming your course content. and those are the people who they're not starting at zero. They're already at one or two and they want to get closer to 10. And so the more that you can work with people who have some skill baseline, some momentum baseline, the more people are going to get results from your course. So, I mean, I I've taught to a wide range of skill level, let's say beginner, intermediate, advanced, and I definitely prefer the advanced, the, the beginner crew is, always going to have a higher, let's say, dropout rate of not completing the course and not getting, you know, what they hoped they would get from it. I think the other thing is you, you mentioned this at the beginning is that people, you know, it's great to have great aspirations. Obviously I'm originally from England, so I'm just dire. I have no aspirations. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, um, I do like Americans in general. You're very aspirational. Uh, um, bless your little hearts. <laughs> but uh, um, but the reality is, if for some reason you you got because this is another this is this is bootstrap startup cliche episode, folks. I'm going to come out with another cliche from startup world, <laughs> Ryan. Um, product fit, market product fit. Um, if you I I kind of twisted it and turned it into um, student market fit. Um, Ooh, I like that. Um, so if you did click and you had hundreds and it's your first course, it ain't gonna pan out pan out that well anyway because you're gonna be totally overwhelmed, aren't you? Totally. Like it's <laughs> it's not good to start with hundreds of students in your first course. You got you're gonna to like. I would totally bomb that if I were starting out. <laughs> You've got no resources, no online help. Because um, yeah. the amount of questions that come in is much higher than you think it's going to be. Am totally. I and I think like, you know, as someone who's relatively new to course creation, you, you get inspired, right? The aspirational piece by seeing how many creators out there have had, you know, $50,000 course launch, $100,000 course launch, million dollar course launch for some people, right? And you want to aspire to that too, right? Like that's, that's a natural thing, but 
you don't just get there overnight. Like, and honestly, anyone who does drive those kind of numbers in their first course sale, like you're going to be overwhelmed. And so I'm, I'm a huge advocate of doing things the slow way, like especially with courses, because you don't want to break yourself in the process of building a community because then the experience is bad. And if the experience is bad, they're not going to want a word of mouth, tell their friends, colleagues, other people in their space about your course. You would rather, in my opinion, do it slower, curate the experience to be great. Also, you're going to iterate your content a ton based on feedback from your early students. And so taking that natural progression is actually the best thing you can do. I kind of link it to sports, really. Let's just take golf. Um, yeah, you know, anybody that gets involved in golf as a career, their aspiration is probably to be like Jack Nicholson or one of the <laughs> giants. And there's always the possibility, but in percentage terms, it's extremely unlikely. But becoming a golf professional and owning a owning a or partial ownership of a of a shop part of a golf course and owning the training side of it i know quite a few people that do that and they've got a very nice living and they've got a very nice life because they like golf and their life's all around golf it's not my cup of tea but so you don't have to be Jack Nicholson to have a really good life in professional sport, do you? No way. Oftentimes, like what I find, so I, I interact with, I interview, I know I get to like become friends with a lot of creators. And what I see is oftentimes it is the people who are a little bit, you know, underground, the ones who aren't publishing videos with headlines talking about their seven figure, you know, course launch or something like that. It's those people who are underground at least a little bit who often have the best balance too in their lives. And I don't know, from my perspective, I don't need a business that makes $10 million a year in order to be happy or fulfilled. I think that to me is not worth the trade off of how much work and, and honestly stress that often invites. So if you had a friend or a colleague or somebody on your radar and you're giving them some consultation, um, what would you map out as the, you know, they've got experience in their industry. They seem legit. They seem to have the right attitude in providing value. You know, obviously people want financially to do well, but it's combining those two needs in a legitimate way. What are the few things, one or two steps that, but they've got no experience on online marketing yeah. um, or not a lot. Um, what would be a couple of things that you would advise them that they need to do that would maybe mooch the needle a little bit so it's more chance it's going to be a success, Ryan? I love this scenario because the way that I approach this will immediately show you where you're at and if you're actually in the right place or not to pursue building a course in this exact moment in time. Because if you are in this place and you don't have somewhere between five and 10 people that you can immediately call, text, email, LinkedIn message, people that you actually really know, even if it's an online kind of relationship and ask them if they would buy a course from you on this fill in the blank topic, then I think you're in a position where you need to take a step back and figure out how to build more of those connections. Because if you're starting from this place and you don't have that crew of say 10 people who are going to test your early content with you, then I think you got to do a little bit of the audience building and relationship cultivating stuff first. But in my opinion, start with 10 people. If you can get 10 people to pre-order a course from you, and of course, like 
spend some time mapping out what the content is going to be, give people an idea of what they can expect as an outcome on the other side of it, then I think that's the absolute best thing you can do. Well, I think you covered this earlier, right? Earlier on in our conversation, but you use the word conversation, building online relationships. Can you put a bit more meat on that a little bit? What do you what do you really mean in your own mind that really means? With like cultivating online relationships yeah. with people? Yes. What I really like try and do myself, and again, like I go through phases. I'm human, I go through phases of how social I'm feeling, right? And so what I really like to do is to think ahead of time. Even if I come across a creator that I want to connect with just organically on say YouTube or Instagram or a friend sends me their stuff and I kind of connect it in my mind of like, oh, this would be a cool person if I could collaborate with them. But often case for me at least, I'm not quite ready. I'm not in the perfect position to say maximize the potential of win, win, win with that other creator. And so I'll take a step back. I won't send them an email or a DM right away. I'll say, all right, I want to collaborate with so-and-so because I think I can provide value to him. I can provide value to his audience and I benefit too. So I, I really like to think through what is the strategy that gets a win for everybody here. And often that ends up being leaning into what my strengths are. And so for me, that's content creation. I'll usually eventually reach out with some sort of video or guest post idea that I've put some thought into and identified, hey, this is a gap in the content on your channel or on your blog, and I would love to fill that for you. Can I make this video and a companion blog post for you? And that's a really compelling offer to someone who has an audience that wants more content on these topics. And when the content is coming from like me in this case, a creator who has done this for a long time, it's really appealing. So I think that's perhaps a little bit different advice than say when you're just getting started. But if you can figure out a way to structure a win-win-win for the creator, their audience, and for you all in the mix, that's the name of the game. All right, Dio, thanks for that. I think it's a good place for us to go for our middle break. We've got some more messages from our major sponsors. We will be back in a few moments, folks. Tired of hosting providers that can't handle high traffic loads? Convesio is here to help. Our platform can handle any amount of traffic all without slowing down or crashing. With immediate Slack support, performance optimization, and a team that thrives on resolving technical challenges, your e-commerce business is in safe hands. Learn more about Convesio at Convesio.com. This podcast episode is brought to you by Lifter LMS, the leading learning management system solution for WordPress. If you or your client are creating any kind of online course, training-based membership website, or any type of e-learning project, Lifter LMS is the most secure, stable, well-supported solution on the market. Go to lifterlms.com and save 20% at checkout with coupon code PODCAST20. That's PODCAST20. Enjoy the rest of your show. We're coming back, folks. We've had a feast of knowledge from Ryan. Um, he seems to be still laughing at my jokes, <laughs> so that's a good sign. Um, before we go into the second half of this great interview, I want to point out we've got a great free resource if you're looking to build your membership website. We've got a great community on Facebook. It's the Membership Machine Facebook group. Um, totally free. It's a mixture of WordPress professionals and people like you trying to build a membership website. Why don't you go and join us? Um, I'm always posting 
new content on there and if you've got any questions that's a great resource for you so go over there so let's go into the world of AI you know Ryan has I've got some good news for you Ryan uh, um, Ryan I think with a partner I'm just going by my memory from our last chat um, has an AI based product um, Kirk signed up my co-host of my other podcast Ryan and he's been using it and he's been giving me some good um, he's impressed Ryan he, um, he's been singing the praises of it oh I love it I love it yeah that's the I, I had a back and forth with him too and uh, it seems like he's digging the content that it creates and this, we're talking about right blogger here by the way this is my my suite of 78 79 right now tools we're always adding more for content creators and most of them are ai powered yeah he, um, he, he's been saying good things about it so you've got a bit of knowledge about AI then um we get we do really have a true expert here folks um we have somebody that's been highly successful in the digital world and the membership world so ryan really does know his stuff um so there's a lot of flux about ai and about content and obviously um, there's enormous forces at play and there's a lot on the line here and any disruptive technology there's going to be winners and there's going to be losers um how do you envision how AI is going to change digital? Only a small question, but we can spend <laughs> a, a bit of time on it. Um, how do you see d digital marketing being changed in the next couple of years by AI? Oh, man. I mean, I think it's already completely changed. And there's a lot of people that haven't yet adapted to it. And here's what my take is. I think that AI is simply a tool. It's never going to replace human creators because AI, let's say at least today, who knows? I don't want to eat my own words 20 years from now, but AI today cannot empathize. It cannot feel. It does not have true human experience it's an emulation a simulation of oh it sounds like most like. see it sounds like most of american corporate leadership <laughs> doesn't it yes it does <laughs> it, you know no coincidence is there it's probably trained on a lot of that material <laughs> <laughs> sorry i couldn't resist it sorry Ryan. well here's here's what i think though i i really believe that ai at least as far as let's say you know for marketing and content creators it's going to be a tool and it's a tool that is you know, somewhat self-learning these models are are being trained and leveled up constantly and so we're going to see these tools continue to get better and better and better and so from my perspective ai helping out with written based content primarily is the no-brainer use case today and it's getting so good like as you said, Kirk's been using Right Blogger and he's been pretty pumped about the results of the content he's creating with it. So I've found it to be an incredibly and useful he's fussy. Tool. He's fussy. He's actually written a couple of books. He's actually written a couple of books and he's in the motor industry. Yeah. Um, he is quite a large influencer in the motorsport dealership, motorcycle, motor car industry. That's where he makes most of his money um so he's fussy so that's reasonably high price ryan and it's only getting better too uh, what i find is the best use case for ui or for ai today is really taking things off your plate that you don't enjoy so much and so i don't know about you but i go through phases of how much i love writing a blog post from start to finish how much i love outlining how much i love you know, headlines, meta descriptions, all the different various components, optimizing it for SEO. These are things that sometimes I love, sometimes I just kind of don't like at all. And so tools that can outsource these bits and pieces to you, at least first drafts, 
are a really, really great use case for AI. And I think what the, the future of digital marketing looks like, and we're seeing it already, this is not a surprise, is that video content pretty much overnight just became the most important thing that you can do and get better at, build your skill, build your craft, kind of knock down those limiting self-beliefs if you're afraid to be on camera. That's the kind of stuff that I don't know where AI is going to be with video, say, 10 years from now. But today, AI video is not amazing. And I think it'll really take a long time if it ever can get to a place of real genuine human level content. And even then, it won't be the same. It'll be different. So I think there's always going to be a market for high quality human grade content, if we want to call it that. I've been thinking a bit about this myself and one word comes to me and it's called experience. Yeah. And what I mean by this, Ryan, is stay with me on this, Ryan, and then give me an honest critique because um, I actually being honest here, I think you you have much more knowledge than me in this subject. Um, AI when it's used well, enhances experience. When it's done badly, it detracts experience. Example, YouTube. I published, I'm grinding it out what YouTube wants and what other platforms wants is very different. And I'm trying not having to duplicate content just for one platform and it's tricky but i notice on youtube since um, ai artwork there's loads of thumbnails that are misleading like that they have a very attractive lady on the thumbnail and when you click <laughs> the video it's some old geezer like me going on for half an hour uh, and it's kind of misleading or so that's a very primitive example but that's not enhancing the experience that's that's detracting the experience because i tend to do, not watch it because i think i've been misled yeah you know i was expecting a very attractive lady with something interesting to say and i've got some old geezer like me and my face it's not a very attractive proposition <laughs> is it ryan uh um, so that's a very brutal, but do you think I'm on the right track there? Yeah, what I would chalk this up to being is just, it's a misalignment of a use case for AI. You know, like there's there's nothing wrong with using AI for image generation, but you got to think about the use case for it. Like if, you, if you're using AI to generate some like stock images that, you know, you have a particular vision for it and you can't find the right stock image somewhere, have AI create one and put that somewhere in your blog post or use it as you're editing, you know, YouTube video or something. I think that's great, but it should not be used as a tool to essentially mislead people. And I guess, you know, people have been doing misleading marketing forever. This is just a new way yeah. to do it. <laughs> so where do you think we are in e-learning the membership space? Because obviously I did an episode last week. It was a fun episode with a lady called Nicole. And she has a small but growing YouTube following. And I'm one of them. And she does, there's a whole niche of people that do reviews on about online grifters <laughs> oh yeah i think and of coffeezilla as like the big huge yeah she's a, she's mercilessly copied that but she's a female and it's not many females there's a few that have gone into it but she does quite a good job she hasn't got a very large youtube channel but it is growing and i've been watching her stuff so i brought one and we had a feast about some of the leading well, in my opinion, there was a lot of my opinion in that video last week, Ryan. Did you guys talk about Mr. the Mr. Beast saga? Did that come up? No, we just we had a list of, in my opinion, Ryan, some of the biggest grifters in the online space. Uh, who's who of negative talent, in my opinion. 
There was a lot of my opinion and Nicole's opinion, right? Um, how, but it seems part of American culture as well. Um, but th there must be a receptive audience because obviously you, you, anybody that's got any experience of online marketing, if the audience is totally unreceptive, you're not going to get nowhere. So you do, you obviously marketing has linkage to propaganda as well. Um, but there always has to be a receptive audience because you can't, you can't make people, no matter how effective prop, a marketing, digital marketer you are or propagandist, the audience must be receptive to the messages, the core message, in my opinion. But how much damage do you think? Because I think there is a kind of subculture that there seems to be an enormous amount of opportunity still in membership. But it also seems to be a little bit tarnished by these, in my opinion, these digital grifters. Um, what's your own thoughts about all this, Ryan? I actually have a lot of thoughts about this. So something that I'm extremely careful not to do on all of my course landing pages and in my marketing material is I do not make promises of what your outcome is going to be after yeah, the I have noticed that. Actually, you could have made so much more money if you just promised the earth, couldn't you? I mean, here's the thing about the, the fine line between marketing and let's say misleading. I don't want to say grifting, but misleading is that if you promise specific outcomes for people, that in my opinion is almost always going to be misleading because what you're teaching is based on your own unique experiences throughout the entire course of your life. Everything that you've learned, everyone you've met, all the experiences you've had have led you to where you are today. And every other person who joins your membership community or course is coming from a different set of experiences. And while some people, hell yeah, can get the same results or even better than you, most people are not going to get the exact same results. That's just the reality of it. So. I really try and not to lean into kind of that promise of, you know, my flagship course is called Built to Blog and I teach everything from starting the blog, all the technical bits, all the way up to driving traffic, monetizing, you know, building relationships and doing the whole spectrum of the blogging business. But I don't promise people, hey, this course will get you to a $1,000 a month blog or a $10,000 a month blog because that's just unrealistic for the vast majority of people. So many things have to go right and the timing has to align. And I think there's just a, a really careful nuanced line. You got to walk between marketing and misleading people. So no, you got to know what feels right to you inside. And I think looking at other course landing pages will show you if you tune into how you're feeling when you're reading through some other course landing pages, you'll feel what's right or what's not to you. And oftentimes things like income claims, like mm, that stuff doesn't feel right to me. Yeah, I think you're totally right there. Let's talk a little bit about SEO and blogging and content production. Um, I think Google's in a bit of a tricky spot, but I also think those that say, you know, obviously Google's facing ever increasing legal challenges to itself, because in my opinion, it is a monopoly and it's been there for a long time. And in some ways it seems to be getting more aggressive. <laughs> um, when it comes to profitability, I think its last quarter was one of the best quarters that Google's ever had. Um, obviously, when you have a monopoly, you don't want to let go of a monopoly. <laughs> no. Um, but, and people say, oh, AI will destroy search. I think search is a much more complicated and multifaceted animal than most people realize. I think there's all sorts of kinds of searches. 
and out comes have you been thinking about this at all if so have you got any thoughts about this oh man so many thoughts so from my oh, perspective please share them, right? <laughs> <laughs> what i'm seeing happen that this is the big thing right so we can pontificate all we want but what i'm seeing happen is that i'm actually getting more traffic these days i'm not getting less traffic as a result of google beginning to roll out some of the ai featured snippets whatever we want to call them the google search or generative search experience i don't think i think they're trying stuff out but there's something missing isn't there or is it just me oh there's something missing for sure i mean you'll probably remember it was maybe a month or two ago when they they rolled it out like across almost like every search query at first and there was an online frenzy going on of people googling stuff like how many rocks should i eat per day and the ai was pulling you know snippets and advice from these like joke websites and it was saying the average american should consume two to three pebbles a day for optimal health and it's like what the hell and so i've been, I've been doing that for years ryan <laughs> The, yeah, just just a couple pebbles a day. <laughs> but this is a great example of like AI not being ready yet to answer like mass queries and, and especially on stuff like medical, health, nutrition. Like there's some really like third rail topics there that I think Google is now going to be way more sensitive to putting like the the AI results for. And so Here's the thing, SEO has been dead, you know, about once a year, every year for the past 10 plus years that I've been paying attention to it. And it's never actually dying, it's just changing. And SEO is always changing, but it's just changing in different ways now than it was before. And so figuring out how you can land, call it a featured snippet or become the top cited source in these kinds of AI search results is sort of the name of the game now because people will always, some percentage of people will always want the quick answer to something. And reading the AI generated answer is essentially no different than reading what's pulled into the featured snippet, which is that top result that's been around for years now. And for those people who want the quick answer, that's all they're ever gonna need. But when you bring someone to your blog or a YouTube video who wants to go deeper on the subject matter related to that you know, quick answer, that's when it's still a really important SEO play to get to the top of Google search results. So that hasn't changed essentially at all. And if anything, it gives you the opportunity to create more in-depth content, more personality driven content and that's why i like i really recommend video these days as a way to teach more in depth more interesting things with your audience beyond just what you know a written blog post can do yeah i think it's all i think you must have read my mind i think you were spot on with your observations there because i think i think if you just want a short quick answer let you know what how many miles do I have to drive from Carson City to Denver, right? What are some of the best stopping points in Dem from Carson City to Denver? If you put that into search at the present moment, it's just terrible. Yeah, the stuff that is shown to you, it's and arguably, you don't want to go to someone's blog to read that kind of a thing and try and pick out the needle in the haystack you want well you might do answer. it shows you a quick list of the, the things that you might like and then it has links and you click on the link to find out more about that particular yeah. stop off point or attraction right but that kind of search at the present moment is awful and i think there's also the commercial pressure on google it's schizoid isn't it and i think that can happen to a lot of bigger businesses there's so many competing um issues or requirements that it becomes kind of a kind of schizoid organization yeah. where it's fighting 
different parts of itself and I, I think you can clearly see that in Google because even before AI it had some considerable problems the ever increasing amount of sponsored links which is great for the bottom line but it was getting to, and the constant change of content that they would show most of it in my opinion was appalling and didn't have any real value to the search intent of the person that put the query in and it seemed to be getting worse and i think only ai has only added gas to the bonfire what do you think of what i've just said i think what we're looking at is we're looking at ai taking its first baby steps or maybe it's still crawling even and i think you know a big company like google they often drink their own kool-aid to an extent and i think they rolled out something that was so far from ready that they thought hey this thing is ready to run and give well i think the they were answer. forced a little bit by open ai weren't they yeah oh they were caught totally off guard which is i mean honestly for a company like google that's that's embarrassing i think that was a public embarrassment for them to be caught so off guard from a pretty much new to the world company on something that changed their industry and so yeah, you see a lot of like quick trigger action stuff going on from Google right now. And I would expect them to potentially make more mistakes with rolling out all this AI products because they're trying to do it in a hurry now. So what do you think in in, an, in a year's time or 18 months? Because I can't, if I ask you any further out than that, <laughs> I think I'm just asking you to make very broad specific can't talk Ryan that's a problem for a podcast doing it speculative <laughs> views if I can ask you where do you think this is going to affect the success of blogging in a year's time do you think because you said you got more traffic and you know other people that got more traffic do you think if you play it the right way and you keep yourself educated the fundamentals aren't going to fundamentally change in the next year 18 months is that your feeling i think that's at least mostly true i think this ai is introducing changes in a way that we have not seen changes before so there's always going to be some curveballs with this one but from my perspective things that will go away are things like glossary pages like if one of your biggest traffic sources you were relying upon was a glossary of all the terms in your industry and that used to be responsible for a lot of traffic for you that's the kind of stuff that ai is going to do a great job of answering and maybe already but moving into the future those kinds of traffic sources are going to be wiped out but arguably that's not really the kind of traffic you ever would have wanted in well it's low quality intent traffic isn't it you've got to get nope. such a volume to it to, to to turn that into any kind of quality lead that it's just a it's just a volume game isn't it yeah what i'm seeing is that there's there's going to be a continued shift to long tail topics and really like meeting the intent of the searcher with something that's really like value rich so not just cursory content not just using tools like WriteBlogger to generate a quick article and not read it and not edit it, inject your own life experiences into it before publishing. These are all really important things if you're using AI tools. You got to weave yourself into them. And so what I see happening a year, 18 months down the line, is people continuing to figure out the ways to weave AI into your content creation process and find the components and pieces that genuinely help you to unlock more time for what you like doing in your content and take again this long tail focus so what are the more particular specific queries that people are asking related to your you know your niche your industry that you can help out with and then do that as much as you can please with video and then you can use tools like ai inside of right blogger we actually have the YouTube video to blog post generator, it's my favorite tool. It takes any YouTube video you publish 
and it turns it into a first draft blog post for you in like less than a minute. So those are the kinds of use cases where if you adopt a video first creation process, you'll be able to use these tools to actually help you repurpose your content around and, and spread it to different platforms. So this goes to the last question and a quick follow after that, and then we wrap it up. Um, I think we asked you, you this question. It's my rep, one of my regular questions on the other show, the WP tonic. Um, so if you had a time machine like HG mm. Wells or Doctor Who, love my Doctor Who. I'm English folks, so I love. I, as a kid, the cyber, the cyber robots and the Daleks they used to scare <laughs> the hell out of me. I used to hide under, behind the settee. Uh, um, used to scare the heaps out of me. Um, still do. I still hide under my settee. Folks. There we go. Uh, um, Truth. <laughs> Truth to power. Uh, um, so if you had your own time machine and you could go back and you could just, could, you know, in your 20s, um, I, that was so long ago, I can't remember any of it, Brian. But uh, for you, you're still a young snipper snapper. Uh, um, so uh, if you could go back and just give yourself one or two quick tips, like not coming on this podcast, <laughs> uh, um, what would you, uh, what would you tell yourself? Something went seriously wrong. If I'm here today, no, um, exactly. This is. Fun. I, I, no. I was going to point it out, but you're quick, so you've worked, you've worked it out yourself, haven't you? <laughs> the biggest thing, honestly, this is this is very real. This is not a regret I have, but this is what I would tell my say. 24 year old self start making videos today. If I could go back 10 years, I would start making videos immediately. That was when, you know, YouTube wasn't new by any stretch of the imagination, but that was definitely when a lot of people who are say popular creators who have massive, you know, YouTube followings got their start 10 ish years ago. And that is really like, it's really telling. And, that's not to say that you can't start today and, and build up a following because you can. And in fact, that's what I'm doing, right? So I'm almost at 5,000 subscribers on YouTube and it's a grind as you know, too. Like it just takes time and repetition and consistency and learning the craft, getting better at things like, you know, lighting and the scripting oh, I don't videos. I just, knock it, I just knock it out. <laughs> I <laughs> just keep knocking it out. But I'm trying to work out uh, what I can do that can affect multiple platforms. And yeah. um, that's tricky because they, they're they they're all different, aren't they? Totally. What, um, so that's a tricky thing. I think the hindsight advice, though, is always going to be, for me at least, it's going to be pretty platform related. So it would be like, Hey, take YouTube seriously or take Instagram real seriously as soon as that came out. But you know, some of the stuff you just can't know, you got to go through it your own way. Well, I just like podcasting. Um, I like, and I, I do like YouTube, but in some, some ways I watch too much of it, but I think it's better to watch YouTube than, than American television. There's only, so, <laughs> there's only so many murders that you can watch, isn't it? It's a, and then they wonder why there's a, a violent crime problem. Well, m maybe it's to do your television churning out violence and murder all the time. <laughs> if that's what you think's going on, that's what ends up going on more. <laughs> Just a little bit of insight. I might be totally wrong, beloved listeners and viewers. Ryan, it's been a fun discussion. Uh, I, I think you've enjoyed it. I get, I get a sense. I think we've covered a ton of stuff. Yeah. What's the best way for people to find out more about you personally and your your AI company and whatever else you want to promote, Ryan? I think you've earned the right to have a good <laughs> plug of the things you want to, Ryan. You provided a lot of value. Thank you. I appreciate that. And and I hope so too. Um, if anyone wants to send me some hate mail, I'm Ryan at ryrob.com. Uh, my blog, ryrob.com, R-Y-R-O-B. That's kind of my home base for all things on the internet. Um, and you can, you can find me very easily from there. But yeah, right blogger is my main focus today. R-I-G-H-T blogger.com. And that's our tool suite of, we've got almost 3000 active customers who are 
using all of our different tools to help create more content. And I think the real use case for AI, repurposing it. So figuring out ways to better promote and distribute your content. And these are the kinds of things AI can help out with a lot right now. Can I ask a quick ending question? How do you personally deal with negativity online personally? Because um, I think that's something people people fear about putting themselves online because there is a lot of negativity out there, isn't it? You know, like you put a YouTube video and they say, oh, you don't know what you're talking about, blah, blah, blah. And you just think, well, the obvious answer is don't watch the video, mate, if you don't, exactly. you know. Um, but how do you deal with it yourself? I think the best piece of advice that someone shared with me once was that if you're going to create content, if you're going to publish yourself online, whether it's written or you know, video, audio, whatever, it doesn't really matter. You have to accept and expect to be embarrassed by it. Like if you look at the people who are literally top of their game at creating the content that you like, they did not get there overnight. You, the only way to get to being amazing at your craft is to go through being shitty at it for a while. And when you're publishing stuff that doesn't look like you know, the top level looking stuff in your space, it's going to be embarrassing. People are going to throw some comments at it and you got to be okay with that because here's what I believe. Life is such a journey. And if you take negative feedback from someone and you internalize it and you change who you are and what you're doing based on it, you're going to end up being really disappointed in yourself over time. So my advice you know, I think you can embrace the haters because from my perspective, most people who are leaving negative comments online are not the ones who are creating content at all. They're just consuming it and being very critical about it. So I think that's a fantastic insight, yeah. actually, Ryan. I think you're a spot on. The if you get that. critical feedback from someone who's another creator in your space, then that is the kind of stuff to like maybe consider, you know, how you can take in that mm. feedback. But keep in mind, most people leaving hate comments are not making something. If you're making well, stuff, you're already- Well, a lot winning. of them are professional trolls, aren't they? <laughs> this, this, totally. Yeah. Right, Ryan, it's been fab. We're gonna end it now. Listeners and viewers, we've got some great guests and topics coming up in the next few weeks. We will be back next week. See you soon, bye.